Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to the Hockey Podcast. My name is Kevin Olenek. You can follow uh, us on Twitter at podcast underscore hockey. You can also like us on uh, Facebook, uh, the Hockey Podcast. Uh, Twitter, as I said, pod, uh, it's podcast underscore hockey. And uh, as well on Instagram, uh, podcast underscore hockey. It has been a very... Um, Interesting weekend where emotions are a little bit all over the place. Uh, in some cases, some people were just going, as an example, Sean Tyler on Thursday. Was was this after Calgary blew a 3-2 to two lead with a 0.1 seconds to go and lose in overtime? Was this partly your reaction? <laughs> was that your reaction? A little bit. I was more like, oh, that's a shame. But <laughs> oh. I mean, Canucks had a game against Ottawa on Thursday. It was just the you know ripe for uh, a trap game, and they lost. So <laughs> whatever feelings were short lived. Fair, fair, and and then on Sunday, were you feeling a little bit like after the? Canucks blew a three to one lead or a three one lead with seven and change left. Were you feeling a little bit like this? No, God! No, God! Please, no! 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 So it was something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Heidi, Devin, were how were were those feelings that you felt as well? Um, I felt that that last feeling about the the, the Nashville game. The the uh, that's it's very slow no, coming. But he's God. he's cut. Yeah. Yes. That no, one. God, please no, 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 no. That one. Yeah, and then and then yesterday it was a bit of. <laughs> yeah, it was. That's the benefit of doing a flame of two team podcast is you get to kind of rub rub each other's wounds, uh, rub each other's pain into wounds and things like that, right? Isn't that the nice thing? Salt into the wound. And you rub the one salt into the. <laughs> yes, English is my first language. It's my best language too. It's gooder than the others. Uh, um. Anyway, yes. Um. Is everyone doing okay? Are we? How are we do- doing uh, after – it's been kind of an interesting week emotionally. We'll, we'll get into this, but um, we'll hear from the two teams here in a moment here as well. Uh, but how are we feeling? The Flames come away – we'll start with the Flames first. The Flames came away, uh, and I'm, I'm going to present a proposal here. And I used the wrong words in message. I have a better way that I've worded this. But the Flames came away from a road trip with a 3-1-1 one one road trip where they won a game in a place that is hard to win, which which is was a, almost like a guarantee loss in Boston. Uh, they did get the easy win in... The air, I'm using air quote, the easy win in Detroit. Uh, they had the... Loss of a point in Nashville. They had the loss in Tampa Bay. Uh, and then they had the big win in Florida. So, Devin, Heidi, we'll start with you. Maybe my word was like turning point. But maybe it was... It, when we look back, and I did a little bit more digging into this. And my, my digging is, it isn't going to bring anything super significant to spoiler alert. But there are points in the year that there's a difference of where why teams finish in certain places and others. And I would argue when we look back on the year that these two road trips are significant points of we're going to see why teams felt landed up in places that they did. Um, Dev and Heidi, are you feeling good about the Flames right now? <clears throat> I definitely am. It's, uh, well, I mean... <laughs> Yes, after this road trip, I feel good. Uh, but knowing the Pacific and how the ebbs and flows of the Canucks have been and um, just watching each team, you know, Vegas just lost uh, Mark Stone uh, for a significant amount of time. You know, they're, they're, 
the ups and downs are are definitely there and are definitely uh prominent within within the the division so it's as of right now it's a high but you know it could all change within uh the next few games so it's uh it, it's really it's gonna be interesting to see how it comes down in the in the final stretch here um i'm feeling i was feeling better about the flames i don't know if i'm necessarily still feel if i'm feeling super excited and happy i want to see how they do now that they're going to be back at home because that is where they were struggling was is at home so i want to see if uh, they can kind of continue some of this uh, road momentum back that back at the at the saddle dome sean tyler um so looking at this road trip you had uh, a rough start against montreal but you pulled out an overtime victory you had a a tough opponent, a tough game, probably a game. I don't want to say it was one of those points that you two points that you wanted that you probably were assuming in your back pocket in Ottawa. You would think uh, you had a so so could have went either way against Toronto, and then you blew the lead against Columbus. How are you feeling at this point in time? It's a road trip that ended up being one and three. Uh, and I would argue was an easier road trip in terms of opponent strength of opponent than the Flames. Are you feeling, how are you feeling about the Canucks at this point in time? I am a little concerned, but they they still have a game on Wednesday versus Arizona. So that's huge. Uh, uh, they've got uh, 2000s era night on Friday versus Colorado. So they've done really well on, on those special nights this year. So um, hopefully they can continue that, that along. And then on Sunday, they can, uh, they have a, they have a chance to um, redeem, have some redemption against Columbus. So I think there's uh there's, there, there's a chance to, to find a way out of this hole. Um, it's, it's concerning, but uh, how they, how they uh, react and, and if they can recover will, will determine their season. I'm not at panic mode or worried significantly yet, but I would, I would say, you know, if it was mildly concerned before, it's extremely concerned now. Uh, the game's played column is still working in their favor. So, you know, there's that, that you look at the points and the, and, and teams leapfrog and the Canucks in the standings, such as the flames. And, you know, that can cause a lot of panic, but still the, the, the runway is still there for the Canucks. Uh, and I'm optimistic, uh, for the reasons that Sean stated, but, um, they really are at a tipping point here now. I mean, if they don't find a way out of this hole quickly, they won't make the playoffs. It's, you're that you're that's interesting because to me I look at the Canucks and while I don't think that they're in a good place uh observe it like from a big picture way I I have to I will hear from JT Miller in a moment but I do believe they're a playoff team I still you look at the money all the percentages is and they're sitting currently at a 58.6% uh, chance of getting in the playoffs. And the Edmonton Oilers, as we are recording this, are defeating the Nashville Predators 2 nothing. They have a horseshoe uh, up there. 2-2, two, two, Kev. Is it 2-2? Two, two? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I stand corrected. But, well, the Oilers had a horseshoe up their butt in the first period there. I have, <laughs> honest to God, like, you know, I, 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 I you know, I'm on Mike Smith, but uh, the, the guy was literally, the I, I just, side tangent. Mike Smith was playing like he was interpret giving dedicating his game to Dominic Hasek. He's flopping all over the place. Um, like, is there like uh, anyway? Uh, and then Drysaitel scores off a butt and it goes in. I'm like, how are the Oilers ahead two nothing? So okay, it's two two. All right, anyway, but um, I still think the Canucks are a playoff team. I, I don't come out of this thinking that the Canucks are not a playoff team. That third period yesterday did not look like a playoff caliber team. Now, I know it's only one period, one game, but I'd start adding that together with the, the poor start against Toronto. Um, just, uh, I know it was Bobby Ryan having a great game and everything on Thursday, but that was a, just a disaster. I mean, that, that's not, you know, you mentioned it earlier, 
Kevin, that you you think you'd have that game. Well, yeah, that's one you should win, but there's no automatics there. And then you know they lost fairly decisively in that one too. Like, like I mean, those are opportunities being pissed away here. Like they just can't afford to keep doing that. Like they're, they're running out of time. They got 17 games left. Yeah, they need to. They definitely need to buckle down, and especially with Markstrom out, they need to find a way to um, <clears throat> buckle down on the in, uh, defensively and and make it easier on Demko and Deming because. Without, they they're not going to be able to 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 rely on them to uh, to, to to bail them out like Mark Mike Markstrom did uh, for the majority of this this season. So um, they really do need to find a way to, to batten down the hatches and and just grind out some wins here. They they don't have to be pretty, but if they can grind out some wins and go about to play about five hundred, there's the 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 odds are that they make the playoffs. So if they can find a way to get to, say, four, five, six, five out of six points in the next three games, that goes a long way, a long way to helping them. So uh, that's, what I, that's why I'm not, in, I'm not throwing it into panic mode where I'm, put it, I'm starting to go into tankathon.com and, and doing a lotto simulation because they're still in the playoffs. They can still – they can – they're – the uh, – their fate is still in the Canucks' hands. They've got games in hand against the the Flames. They've got games in hand against Vegas. They can still get back into first or second in this division with a, with some strong play. So just turn it like turn the page, figure out what happened, and fix it. Yeah, well, that's basically what JT Miller had to say, and he. Yeah, it's a good, good game, game at the end of the road, road trip, trip. Uh, against a good team. team. And then it's just, just kind of a blackout in the last nine minutes. minutes. Um, they they drop a couple penalties, get a couple goals before you know it's over. So, so. It's, just it's just part, part of uh, this time, time of year, you know, finding, finding ways to win. win. That's a must for us right there. there. Up, up two, especially, especially on the road. You know, it's a good spot. We needed to win tonight. And even though we played a good game, it's still part of playing a good game is finding a way to win and closing teams out. Yeah, so that was JT Miller having to say his say on that. Now, just to get back to the Flames for a second here, and, and Heidi brought, brought up a good point because the road has not been an issue for the Flames at all. They're one of the they they are they are one of the best teams on the road uh, this year, but at home, I don't. It's it's a place been a place of misery, and the majority of their games are at home. And the other concern with the Flames really is. When it feels like a corner has been turned, there's always been a step back. Um, so looking at this, I'll tell you one couple of good things that I... I'm going to start with a compliment to a guy that I haven't been... Comp- we have we have admittedly have not been complimentary to. And I, I, I start by, by presenting this with some condolences. Uh, of course, obviously, Johnny Gaudreau... Uh, losing his uh, grandfather, uh, that's a very sad uh, thing, and I my condolences to him. But um, the Johnny Gaudreau that I am noticing, he has quietly been an appointed game player the last bit here, the last couple of last month and a bit of the year. And I honestly have to admit, I feel like this guy's game has changed a bit, and I watch him, and I. Like this beard that looks, I it, it may have looked a little weird, and his hair is growing. Is Johnny Gaudreau growing up? Is are we seeing a different Johnny Gaudreau? Is it just me? He's hit puberty. He's sixteen years old now. <laughs> hit him. For, throwing hit shots him. already. Jesus. <laughs> I, to your point, Kevin, I I think you know he he's he's gone through the ups and flows of uh, you know being really coming to league and uh, being able to produce points as as much as he did at the beginning of his career and uh, he kind of you know go up and down from there uh, and last year was a big high for him and uh, this year hasn't really been. Um, kind to him i guess uh every once well I, I, a large part of the year it's been you know where's johnny gaudreau but the last uh, last little bit here he's been picking it up and it's it's good timing because uh you know the playoffs are starting 
within the next uh, 15 games here or so. And so it's, uh, as for, is he growing up? Yeah. You know, his beard is a little uh, scraggly, but, you know, I, uh, I, as long as he keeps on uh, producing the way he is right now, um, come, coming into the important time of year, then, you know, if, if this is grown up Johnny, I'll take it. Yeah, I know. It's nice to see Johnny uh, kind of pick his game up again. And I think like we were, when we were criticizing him, we were we were saying that he's somebody who needs to get his game going. And uh, now that maybe it has, now it's like given a little bit of a push to the to the rest of the team as well. So that'll be uh, that'll be nice to see if he can uh, keep that going for sure. And I think his attempts to grow out his hair and grow his beard is adorable. Aw. Does he look older? Does he look older than sixteen to you, Tao? Uh, he still he still looks like he's under twenty. Fair, okay. He's definitely looking more grown up. You know, he's got that. He's looking a little more distinguished, shall we say? Yeah, fair. Uh, and the other thing um, is the emer. I, I don't. I want to say the emergence. It's a wrong word. The reinvention of Michael Backlund. Of course, he had the the time on the wing with Monaghan and Gaudreau, and it didn't work. And he's been put back in center. And um, quite frankly, he's him, and we'll get to the Kachuk and um, Bread Manjapani. Uh, the line I want to call the pizza line, that but that has been forbidden. Apparently, that is not the line, the name of that line, and it is a stupid line name. Apparently. But Michael Backlund has come, has risen from the ashes. Uh, what what happened here? What did we did we underestimate Michael Backlund, or is this team trying to is starting to pick up its game? I think with Backlund, like I think now that he's kind of back on that line um, with uh, Manjupani and, and Kachuk, like I think that's helping for sure. He seems to be consistent there, and like as we've mentioned before, and I still think is a big thing. As I think he is finally maybe uh, adjusting a little bit to uh, he still has a he still has a baby at home too. Like that can't be a. The, the world's greatest thing, but she's getting older now too. So maybe she sleeps a little bit better. And then, so he sleeps a little bit better. Who knows? Um, but yeah, no, it's really nice to see, uh, like just with, just like with Johnny and we were all kind of criticizing Johnny and then we were criticizing Backlund. Like it's nice to, it's nice to see them both, uh, them both going now. That's what, the, that's what the team needs. I think. Yeah. It's uh, it. Him back at center, I think, is a big, uh, a big thing for him. It's where he's comfortable. It's where he's played most of his career. Uh, being on the the wing, uh, I don't think really benefited him in his style of play. He's more of a, um, he, he's just. I think he's better in the defensive zone uh, as a as a center, being down, uh, helping out the the defense, and um, it's. I think also getting back with Kachuk, uh, it's been uh, it's been an uplift because I feel like those two feed off each other when Kachuk's going, Backlund's going, and vice versa. That's what I've seen, and it's you know I, I feel like it's bringing back it's brought back the feistiness of Backlund. Um, ever since Kachuk's been on the team, it, it, you can you you can see that kind of get rubbed off on Backlund from Kachuk, and uh, you know I mean there's. Uh, Proof with the the battle with Marshawn, um, and getting getting him off of his game or on his game or on his level or whatever you want to call it, but uh, it's uh, it's definitely been um, a good compliment to have those two together, and let alone having uh, Majipani on the other side there uh, ripping it up too. And uh, it's it's been a good emergence from from both Backlund and Majipani. Uh, I, I think uh, it kind of shows Kachuk's leadership skills and. Um, how good of a player he actually is. So it uh, is definitely a warm welcome. Uh, speaking of Manjapani, uh, 17 goals, 12 assists, 29 points. Um, and Vancouver, uh, Jake Vertanen, 18 goals, 17 assists, 35 points. Of course, there is the shotgun Jake. And Heidi, of course, is the uh, hockey podcast commissioner of shotgun Jake. Uh, but who scores more goals this year, Manjapani or Vertanen? 
And I, I'll ask a diff- another question too. In top of that, who's been better, Majapani or Vertanen? Vertanen's been better uh, all season. Majapani's better has been better lately. Um, I think Majapani probably ends up with more. I think probably ends up with like 21, 22. Well, uh, I think Vertanen ends up with maybe one less. But uh, I think both been very good revelations for both teams. And I agree with all of that there, Kevin. I, I, I think Manjupani will finish ahead in terms of scoring. Yeah, I uh, I agree too, like with that. Like it seems like, like Vertanen's maybe dropped off a little bit off his pace, but um, – and maybe – and maybe Manjapani's pace will slow down now again, but I can still see Manjapani probably getting a little head by that, but not not by much. I just thought it was a fun question to to pose. No, I I, I no, I, I don't think. Well, I I don't think it's yeah. Uh, but everyone agreeing is not doesn't make it a a bad question. I don't think unless uh, Devin, do you disagree? I disagree. No, I'm kidding. I, uh, I I agree with all you. I concur. Yeah. Uh, the the one thing that could put uh, Vertanen back up uh, in my books is if he can stick with Bo Horvat for the foreseeable future. Uh, looks like he he got he got uh, a decent amount of uh, ice time there last night and looked pretty decent. Uh, if he can stay in the top six, then uh, I think that helps him um, start producing again uh, a little bit better. So um, if that because he he played up with uh, Pat Patterson and and Miller at times, um, but he's lately he's been down on the third line with Roussel and Gaudette. So uh, if you can find if they uh, decide to keep him on, uh, with Horvat, then um, this uh, I think he ends up with more. But I'm not sure how how um, how long the, he'll stay there. Would you let's uh, just it's on bridge on that like. I think with um, with the line the um, line combinations here with the Canucks here. I mean, uh, Pedersen, Miller, and Toffoli have been fantastic. It's hard to argue with that as a line together. But I think one of the problems I, I'm I, I'm seeing here a little bit is is a, a an imbalance of offense, which concerns me a little bit with the Flames bit too. But would you put Toffoli with Horvat? It feels like Horvat has played with every right winger except Tyler Toffoli at some point. I think there's a good chance he gets there um, when Besser gets back, if he's back before the end of the regular season. Um, I you might see him, but just because Toffoli has been so lights out with Miller and Pedersen, you can't. There's, I don't know why you would break that up. Yeah, that that seems to be the thing, Kevin. Is the is Green really wants that that definitive uh, high scoring line, and Horvat's a player that's capable of basically taking players under his wing. You know, like like Horvat still got what fifty two points on the season with a revolving door of line mates. So, you know that that's that's how the coach is looking at it, but. <laughs> At, at some point here, you know, if they don't turn this thing around, how stubbornly is the is the coach going to stick with the formula? And and by extension, how stubborn is he going to be about sticking with Louis Erickson? Yeah, well, I, I wonder if Louis Erickson gets off is uh, is taken out of the lineup next game. Like you got to find a way to to send a message, whether it's uh, scra- like you're not with Beagle potentially injured, you're not scratching Sutter, um, you might scratch Roussel, but. Like you, you need to send a, a message to this team um, on Wednesday versus Arizona, and Louis's been sent down to this the fourth line a uh, couple games ago, and then again, uh, and then started uh, on the fourth line and stayed on the fourth line this past this past uh, game. So I really, I really wonder if he's uh, he's uh, uh, press box Louis again here soon. I mean, it's easy for us to make him the whipping boy, but and and there are still strengths to his game defensively, and I'm sure that you know Travis Green wants to make it work with the high paid forward and all that. But uh, I mean, do you wonder, is Green willing to you know stick his his neck out on the line for Louis Erickson? Like you know, if they if they collapse here and they don't make the playoffs, I mean, Green's job security is in question. 
But yeah. um, my my counteract to that is, it wasn't Erickson that made the that took a stupid penalty in the offensive zone. It wasn't Erickson that took a stupid second poke penalty in front of the referee. Mm-hmm. Um. Like I don't know if you call it my opinion based off of the standard that they had set the whole game. Okay, but I'll they. Out there. Oh, okay, Tyler, you you can respond as the ref. Oh, if that not, was... Nonetheless, if they still put it the referee's hands at a bad time there. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it's soft call or not. I, I guess why why. Someone is asking this, and I think that this is a fair criticism, and I'm sorry for this podcast where I'm bouncing all over the place, but I I kind of feel that there's some interesting trends here. Yeah, Heidi, I think tangent counts up to about three now. Yeah, (laughs) no, but I mean, usually I'm structured with a flame flame part and Canuck part, and I'm I'm bouncing. Uh, But why, why is Antoine Roussel not taking the criticism here in this market that he, like... It, why, why Why are we like Louis Erickson needs to be out of the lineup and we're not saying what's wrong with Antoine Roussel? That, that's, that's, that is there. It's just not as loud as get Sutter out of the lineup and get Louis Erickson out of the lineup. It, well, it, it is there. I, I have seen it and I have heard it. People are questioning of whether or not Roussel is good. Is Because Roussel hasn't been hit the Roussel he was last year before the injury. Um this whole season, like you had a couple big spurts with just adrenaline at the beginning of the uh, uh, beginning of the season when he came back, but really hasn't been the same player this season because of that injury. Like it takes a year to get to really come back from a, a major knee surgery like he had. So I think that's part of it too, is the, the majority of people are, are realizing that he is coming back from an injury. So it's there, there's a little bit of leeway there. But there, there is still some questions on that. And that's why I said uh, before, I'm like, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those three are, are out of the lineup and you've got Josh Bailey and, and Zach McEwen both in um, next game. I, I've been seeing a little bit of rumbling things about Roussel as well, but not nearly as loud as uh, calls for something done with Brandon Sutter. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I find that, I, I just, I find, I find it interesting that and you know, I'm not saying that Erickson has been awesome or anything like that, but like, if if it feels a bit like Erickson's becoming the whipping boy, uh, well, he is. It's he's, it's the contract. It's all. It, it so much of the time comes back to that. Of course, yeah, and it always will for him. There's no no dispute about that. I mean, even with Calgary, with Milan Lucic scoring his seventh goal of the year, and it's a million dollar a goal, million dollars a goal. I mean, it, that's like he's always going to be a whipping boy. But I think realistically, it's hard for me to not criticize Roussel for his play if you know if he hasn't yeah. been doing too much. And I don't think that that got at Roussel Vertan in line has been. Has been as strong in the second half of the year as they had, were in the first half of the year for sure. Uh, I feel that Godet's play has 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 drifted a little bit. Just a, a, I'm, I'm on a tangent now. In regards to Bailey uh, as an emergency call up, emergency loan, is there some restriction on how they can pl- use him? Like, do they have to not have enough healthy forwards on their roster or something? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, they, I think they called them up emergency because they weren't sh- like, yeah, Beagle got injured and then they weren't, sh- probably weren't sure about someone else. So they, he's an emergency call up until he goes back down. Um, or the, someone like the Beagle gets healthy again. So, um, they can play him, but, um, it's, it's, be- yeah, it's because they, they, they were down to 12 healthy forwards and they, I guess they were, weren't sure about one other player, I think is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I, most fans, I'm sure, would, would love to see him have a shot over uh, either Erickson or Roussel in the next game. Devin, you, you saw the game on Saturday from the Leafs wearing your Leafs jersey or your Leaf glasses, but uh, what did you see from the Canucks this, this weekend? What, what do you... Yeah, it... You know, the, the recent slide uh, without 
Markstrom in the net is uh, is 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 definitely concerning. But I mean, you guys have the Canucks have 17 games left. Their ne- their next couple of games are Arizona, Colorado, Columbus, um, New York Islanders, Arizona, Colorado, Winnipeg, and Tampa Bay. And then you go on the what or the California road trip there. But like those are those are massive games. Uh, I mean, why why not see what Toffoli has with um, with Horvat? Uh, you know, you have nothing to lose other than you know. Oh, it's not working. Okay, well, throw him back up with Pedersen and uh, Pearson. Like, it, why why not? Uh, you know, put Bailey and McEwen in the lineup. It, it you know switch things up a little bit, especially you know when 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 you're sliding as much as you are right now, and the the questions are in the air. It uh, it uh, if I was uh, Travis Green, you know, I would definitely look look down that road and potentially do a big shakeup uh, just to, you know, get, you know, get in the uh, players heads a little bit, not question their jobs, but making like being like, let's, let's, let's pick it up here, boys. You got 17 games left. Let's, let's go, let's go. You know, it, uh, it, I'm, I am concerned with uh, the, the defensive depth. Once again, I feel like um, Benning could have uh, gotten some, defensive help there but anyways uh, that, that was uh that was a last uh last podcast conversation but yeah i don't know it's uh i, I just feel like why not try switch uh, switch things up a bit what do you got to lose i want to see McEwen get some some ice time on that third line like big big boy can <laughs> he can chuck him too um but uh he's he's it's a good skater he's got some underrated skills uh in the offensive zone Give him a shot. Let him. Let, 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 I want. I'd like to see him in in that left in the uh, on that line in, in place of Roussel, um, and and maybe give Roussel a little bit of a break and try and get his wheels back because I think that's part of the, what's missing from Roussel's game. Yeah, um, yeah. I was. Yeah, I. 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 I it feels a bit um, comfortable. It felt. I think that the takeaway that I come away with the, after the Columbus game is they're com- they're very comfortable right now. The Canucks were very comfortable in the position. Um, they looked around them and they felt like at least top three. Um, and I think this is an interesting wake up call. Uh, the other question here um, is around Thatcher Nemco, and I, I like. There's no question about the value of Jacob Markstrom at this point in time. That's pretty obvious. Um, and Louis Domingue is not going to be a replacement of Markstrom or even Demko at this point. He's going to be a spart- spot player. Um, but Demko didn't have a good week. Uh, I He's had a... a he had a tough game against Ottawa. He had a tough start against Toronto. Settled down in the second period, and then third period, um, third period in Toronto, he struggled. Um, it was obvious. I don't. The I would argue you would were going with Demang either way in Columbus, um, but I, I don't want to be drastic here and say that this is Demko's career moment. But I like he doesn't need to be Markstrom, but he needs to be better. Is Am I? Is that a fair thing? And it, well, be- he needs to not be Patrick Oleem in the playoffs, letting in goals right right through against the Maple Leafs. I mean, it sure looked like that on the second goal the other night. He, yeah, he needs to be better, but so do the Canucks. Like, they need to be better at at, at taking away high high da- high danger scoring chances and shots. Yeah, if they can do that and make make his life a little easier. That makes his his transition into a, a everyday goaltender a, l- a little bit easier. The the issue with that is, have we really seen much of that at all this season from the Canucks? I mean, it's been more just rely on the goalie and they go as the goalie goes. Yeah, and that is the that is the frustrating part. But they have slowly, very slowly, and very incrementally gotten better throughout the season at it. And even like the last three games, they just they've been a little bit unlucky. Um, they've had they've had better. Like if you look at the underlying stats, they've been the better defensive games this uh, of their of their season in the last few, and they just haven't gotten the results. So if you can find if they can continue on with that process, hopefully the luck cut, the luck cut turns around and they can 
grind out these wins. Sounds very similar to Toronto. Just going to put that in there. Well, it it is an interesting stat here. The who wants to take a guess at who the best third period team is in the National Hockey League without using Google? Is it a Canadian team? It is a Canadian team. It's Ottawa. It is Calgary. <laughs> I was going to say Calgary. Calgary, yeah. And forty eight goals for twenty five against. Uh, Chicago's next at plus twenty one. Um, and, but it's, you know, Cal- Vancouver has not been a good third period team really for most of the year. Uh, and, and that's starting to show a little bit here. But um, sorry, Devin, expand on your thought. A bit, like, it, it feels like Toronto. Well, you're just relying on a, uh, on a good goaltender and not having so much of this uh, defensive structure that really – complements the the pieces that are around the team and it yeah that, that that's exactly what i see and uh you know and that's you know kind of gives markstrom uh you know the vesna or the heart uh conversations around the the national hockey league and without without him and how well he's played i uh, it's it's going to be hard for the Canucks to to really solidify themselves as a playoff team if uh, things keep going the same way. But in in Demko's uh, defense, he's 25 years old, right? And you know, he, he, Markstrom always had uh, the uh, persona that he was going to be, you know, the next big thing, and that's why he got traded uh, almost straight up for uh, uh, Luongo and. You know, it's going to take time and, um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and, you know, could he have gotten more starts this year? Yeah, potentially. But, you know, with Markson playing as well as he was, uh, how could you, how could you put him in there more than, than, than he have been? But, um, yeah, that, that, that just seems very similar to Toronto and, uh, and how, uh, how their defensive structure is. So is it structure in, in Vancouver or is it talent? It's more structure than talent in my opinion. I I think they, they're too passive in the defensive zone. Okay. Hmm. I, I'm I'm more inclined to believe it's just a, a little bit of lack of clutch ability right now. They're just 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 tight just it, it kind of looks like they're feeling the pressure out there a little bit just looking at some of the body language it's probably a little bit of that too but uh it's been the the defensive issues have been all season and yeah. i just think they're not they're not pressuring the puck carrier enough and they're afraid to either afraid or being told not to based off of the system to pressure the puck carrier which gives them more time and allows them to create uh, more shots so is that on Travis Green or I, it's, a, I guess it's that, on that Green, on it's on Nolan Baumgartner, who's the defensive coach. It's uh, you, you got to find they 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 need to figure out what just t- learn from this and and start to figure it out. And I think they have a little bit. Like I said, I think they, they have made incremental um, and slow um, improvements on the defensive side. Um, nothing has fully clicked in yet, but you've, we've seen it in, in, in spurts. Like for the most part last night for, as, as JT Miller said, 52 minutes, they were the better team. They made Louis Domingue's night real easy. They get a couple get big saves that he had to make, but for the most part, it was a real easy night for him. Mm-hmm. And then they just fell apart. So it's a little bit of the, the, <laughs> It's just yeah, just not nothing's clicked in quite yet. So whether or not whether it is the Travis Green and Nolan Bob Gardner, or it's the players, the system isn't hasn't quite clicked in yet, and the changes they've tried to make on the fly haven't fully sunk in sunk in yet. I want to get to Travis Green here in a moment because there's a bigger conversation with him that we'll get into. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to touch get, get back on the Flames of here just for a couple of quick seconds. Uh, we have the this week we saw, of course, we talked about the acquisitions of Derek Forbert Board and Eric Gustafson. Uh, they played together on this road trip. Um, thoughts on them, Devin Heidi? We'll start with you. 
Um, I think they've looked. Uh, they've. Uh, I think uh, Gustafson. Gus, Gustafson. I. I can't say that. Uh, has a uh, has uh, looked. A, I think a little bit better. Um, but uh, I. I like them. Like I was surprised to see like you throw the two new guys on a pairing together. Um, just right away the second that they get traded, like there's no. I don't think they got it. They didn't have a day to like even watch a game or anything like that um i've been i've been happy with them i haven't missed uh i i haven't really been missing uh, uh shillington and stone so uh i'm interested to see uh how they're gonna go going forward but other than like you know some obvious mistakes that i think sometimes all defensemen make i think they've uh they've uh for the most part impressed me yeah, I, I, having Gustafson on uh, the first power play unit has been uh, it's been a nice change. I, I'm nothing against Gio, but uh, you know you, you can definitely tell that he's a, a power play specialist, uh, quarterback in that power play. And I'm uh, uh, as far as Forbert goes, he's he, I think he's still trying to find his way. Uh, it, going back to what I said well, like earlier this year. I think the getting more like if you're going to make moves, make moves sooner than later so that the the players can get adjusted to the system, the city, uh, the personal lives, uh, whatever they need to do to make themselves comfortable within the city and within the, the team. Um, it, it, I, I have no doubt that Forbert's going to figure figure himself out and um I, I think it's a good uh good mix of having those two on uh quote unquote the third line and keeping uh your your top four as of right now um together and uh, keeping that familiar familiarity uh but it, i i think they've done a, a decent job of uh, forbert less so than than gustafson but um yeah i think it's uh it's been an, it's been a good uh good pickup for uh for the flames yeah, I've been pretty impressed. I, my, I don't think Derek Forbert should be wearing number twenty. That's a whole other issue. I think twenty should have been. I think twenty should be a number that the Flames retire. To be fair, I think it's a number. Lacrosse. That... Suter, come on. Oh, okay. Oh, jeez. I thought you were going to say Curtis Lazar. Yes, Kurt. Yes, the great Curtis Lazar, <laughs> who played seven good games. Yes. Um, yes, but uh, twenty should be retired and flames land but uh yeah i like i've i didn't think gustison was great against nashville but that was uh i think a whole team and yeah i i don't disagree with that what do you do with the flames goaltending down the stretch here um i've been i honestly have been happier with tal with talbot to be honest like i want to see him get uh more games played with him um, like I, I, I love David Reddick just in general. Um, so, but, uh, I just, I feel like I might just, and it might just be because to do with Reddick and sometimes his emotions and his responses to things like, um, I'm kind of leaning a little bit more wanting to see what, what Talbot can do if he's, uh, he's given a little bit more opportunity. Yeah, I, I think you, you you run with Talbot until he kind of falters a little bit. But uh, with the majority of the the Flames games at home, his uh, ta- or, uh, Riddick's home record is not not anything to run home about. And uh, Talbot, he's been kind of more of your steady Eddie goaltender back there. So run with Talbot until he shows you that uh, he can, and then give uh, give Riddick. Uh, give Riddick the reins, and um, within the playoffs, I don't know. It, it it's it's going to be interesting to see what they do because uh, you know Talbot he he crushed it uh, two years ago, well two and a half years ago with Edmonton. Uh, who says he can't get back to those those numbers and uh, that play? Uh, so I, I don't know. It really depends on who your hot goalie is running down the stretch. Um, if you think about it. Uh, when Pittsburgh won uh, last their or won their last cup, uh, they split, you know, here and there between Murray and Flurry, and uh, they they won it. So uh, you know, run with the hot goalie, and 
uh, right now that's Talbot. Yeah, I'm inclined. I The Flames seem to play a quieter game with Talbot. Like, I love Riddich's emotion. I mean, I I'm not I don't get upset about stick flips or stick smashing. I mean, yes, he probably needs to be a bit careful about who he's swinging it around. Um, he's not the first goalie to do it, but um, I just feel the Flames play a quieter game with Cam Talbot. I, I I feel like Riddich rushes him a little bit right now, and Talbot gives him some calmness. Am I offside there? No, nope, not at all. I I can I totally see that with with a Riddick with Riddick and Nett, it's like almost the the team plays a little bit more intense and and emotional, which is just the type of guy that is that uh, Riddick is. I think and and yeah, you're right. There seems to be a little bit more of a, a steadiness to the game when when Talbot's there for sure. Yeah, looking back at uh, when Smith was in net for us last year, you know, Kevin, you made a uh, a comment. That it, it just seems like it, like it, just his energy that he brings Smith and it, it just rattled the flames and just didn't really give him uh, much uh, stability back there and having you know a calm cool collective uh, goalie uh, look at Carey Price you know he's arguably one of the best in the game and just how he plays so uh, yeah you know it, it gives a different dynamic for sure but. I don't know, you have, you know, a positives and negatives between both of them. I love Riddick and I love his emotion, just like it seems like everybody else on this podcast. But, uh, you know, you, you do notice a bit of a different uh, feel and uh, emotion with uh, with with the team when uh, either of them are in that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's... I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting to see who uh, who they who they go with, uh, depending on the night. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I uh, I mean I would agree that Talbot's a little more like the traditional stoic, calm, quiet goalie. Don't show much emotion. Just just <laughs> just uh, focus on what you're doing. Um, and Kevin, you can leave the uh, getting upset over stick flips to me. Thanks. Oh, what's oh what's that? <laughs> oh. Stick flips, yeah. You, you have you have to give Kevin uh, a little a, a little leeway here. He he wants the Flames to uh, retire one of the dirtiest players in the game uh, numbers. So come on, Gary Suter, come on, Gary Suter. Yeah, he took out Gretzky, Korea. That Korea <laughs> one was just dirty. Come on, <laughs> oh, stop. Okay, I do think you need to add five more for the team. Oh, stop. <laughs> Yes, yes, Gary Suter, <laughs> dirty. That is his legacy. Look up those hits, Kev. Uh, okay, well, I don't think that. I, 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 Devin, do you look at think of Gary Suter as a dirty player? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> it's a whole other tangent about, um, which is tangent number eight. Where I'm, I'm partially keeping track about just kind of how the Flames have treated their alumni. And I, you know, I, I think Gary Suter has not been honored properly by the Calgary Flames. That is my point. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, sp- speaking of, I, I think this is this is a Canuck story in, in its uh, beginning, but I do think that it's going to. I want to hear. I I think it's. Imp- I think we all. I would love to hear from everybody uh, on everything, obviously. But Jeff Patterson last night on the TSN ten forty post game show said that Travis Green is not speaking to him and hasn't spoken to him for a bit uh, due to something that Patterson said. He's not unsure and unclear. Uh, it's not clear what exactly has happened, but Travis Green is not taking questions from Jeff Patterson at this point. So it would be like if it was uh, Eric Francis, Jeff Ward not answering an Eric Francis question, uh, Dave Tippett and not answering a Ryan Rashog question, uh, Sheldon Keefe not answering a Mark Masters question, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you feel about head coaches eliminating or not talking to certain members of the media? Do you think that that is appropriate or do you think this is something that should be settled and questions should always be answered from all media cases? 
I have a simple answer to that one, Kevin, and it's a, it's the old adage, but if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, I think sometimes when a coach is particularly uh, hot and frustrated, you're better off just taking the flack for dodging the press than to go out and say something really counterproductive. That and J. Pat has not been a fr- has not shied away from nitpicking every single decision Travis Green has made all season. He has been very an- antagonist towards Travis Green all season. So if you if he, if you want to be that way, then you have to expect them the the coach to take take appropriate actions at some point to try and protect his image. Because he's going to lash out and he's going to pull a torts. Travis, yeah, yeah, yeah and you're, and you're given the Jeff Pattersons of the world exactly what they're looking for when you do that. Yeah, Tra- Jeff Patterson has tried so hard to find a way to needle Travis Green for every dis- lineup decision he's made. Tra- Jeff Patterson goes on to f- Twitter, finds the. The, the Botchford crew and tries and, and 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 they ask about why isn't McEwen playing and he asked that after a five like after a win like pick your pick your spots understand when you can ask the question and how you can ask the question and the, and people like Travis Green are going to answer it in a very eloquent way. Travis Green was on thirty one thoughts this week with with Merrick and Freeman and he's but he was brilliant he was very good because. They are good interviewers. They understand that you need to have tact. You can't just come in and blatantly, like, it's the Canucks win 4-2, and you go, why wasn't Zach McEwen playing? Like, it just pick your spots, pick your battles, and don't try and, like, and t- make, make yourself an antagonist to the coach. Like, I like Jeff Patterson, but how he's handled this all season, I don't – blame Travis Green for just basically put like shunning him and trying and and moving on because he doesn't want to deal with him yeah it makes it pretty easy for Travis Green to to take the pass when when he's being treated that way having said that I I think he'd be in the mood to take the pass regardless of who was asking the questions yeah given how stunning the collapse was there last night but this wasn't we've had we've had John Tortorella do 30 second like press conferences after the game like he did it in vancouver like he did it every he's done it everywhere yeah and i think that that causes more of a scene than than not even doing it because you're still giving the sound bite you know you're still going up to the podium and looking all cranky and they they run with that but how does it look just to play devil's advocate let's say um i don't ask the question about zach McEwen even though it may be a question that I have, but another person asks the question about Zach McEwen and then Travis Green answers that. Well, again, it's pick your battles, right? And if you've, if you've basically pissed off the coach to the point where he doesn't want to answer your questions, then you need to figure out what you've done wrong and fix it and find a way to make it, make it so that you can ask questions. Yeah, I think there needs to be like a a fair, um, like there needs to be a a mutual understanding between media and and the coaches and everybody else, like, and and respect. Um, If the other day, like, if someone from the media is going to be a dick to the coach, like, then I totally get why the coach might not want to speak to, uh, might not want to speak to that person. And, uh, I don't think there's really anything uh, anything wrong with that. Like, I think I, I don't know if it was Je- Jeff Patterson, but this is the Canucks media that after game one of Elias Pe- Elias Patterson's career, they were questioning his usage. They were saying, "Why didn't he play more than twelve minutes?" Game one, mm-hmm. like, come on, like this is this is why like. Elliot Freeman says the Vancouver media and the Vancouver market is second worst to, to deal with behind Montreal, ahead of Toronto in Canada. It's because you have these people who just want to create a story when there isn't one. David, how do you feel about that since you're the Toronto follower here? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I just want to, yeah, the, 
I think Heidi said it best. Uh, if you treat people res- with it, just, just in general with respect, um, you know, th- th- that goes a long way. I know that it, within my job, if I don't get treated with respect, then the person who doesn't treat me with respect and dignity as a person, uh, you know, they, they, they go down in my books and then, you know, it, like you, you start tuning them out no matter what, whether it's hockey uh, coaches and media relations or whatever, it's uh, treat people with like they're a human being and treat people like who you, like you, how you want to be treated and you'll get the answers that you want to get. Uh, you know, as far as the, I, I would agree with that. Um, the Vancouver media is, yeah, it is definitely second worst to Montreal. Um, to Sean's point and uh, to put to what Elliot said, it's, it, it, it's just looking for a story or a, you know, a, a very, uh, a, a news story that pops and that, that, you know, gets clicks and that gets people's views because of, uh, what 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 they have, and it's just it's it's complete bullshit. It's it's terrible. It's it's it it shows everybody the type of human being you are uh, by bringing other people down and by uh, you know shitting on them. And it's it's it, it's it's hard to watch. It's it it makes me it makes me furious uh, coming from um, you know I just just a work aspect of. You know, if people don't treat me with respect, uh, then why why the hell would I give them the time of day? So good on Travis Green for not talking to him because screw that guy. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's totally relevant. And, uh, you know, it, it might even not nah, <laughs> what I was going to say is, you know, it might even be to the point of, you know, bullying. Uh, and the, in my mind, that has no place in sport, in life, in general. So, you know, uh, screw Jeff Patterson. I, I, <laughs> I like Jeff Patterson as a writer. I, I like him I as a, as as someone who you can bring on to do an al- analysis. I just don't like how he's handled this. I think he's tried. He's tried to basically be the Botchford to Torts the the um, Larry Brooks to torts. He, he wants to create that atmosphere. So it, it, it's a little bit, uh, that's how I feel. And I, and I, and I just don't like, I, I don't think he's done it in any sort of real malicious way, but I do think that Travis Green has just had enough. I mean, he just, he's like, okay, if you, I'm, I just don't want to deal with you anymore. And it's up to Jeff Patterson to go in there, find out what's going on and, and rectify it so that he can ask questions again, because he is a reporter. He does need to do his job, but you got to do it right. You got to do it with res- like no, no when and where you can ask that the, 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 the questions that you want to ask. You can't just come in bull- like a bull in a China shop and and try and knock down all all everything and, and get the story you want. Yeah, and that's you know that's that's the journalism business too. Is is you know the the competition to to get uh, you know something that the others don't get. And there's there's always this built in sort of um, game there, I guess, as far as who's going to be the most. Uh, who's going to be the toughest reporter? Who's going to be known as the one to ask the toughest questions? Who's going to be the most doggone determined to get a, a juicy clip? And Jeff Patterson has taken it upon himself to be that guy. But you do eventually get to the point where you just lose the person because you've gone too far with it. And there are Toronto media examples of this. I mean, Steve Simmons does this all the time. He takes it too far with people and then you know gets backlash or gets shunned. And Dave Festchuk from the Toronto Star is another so it's not a, just a Vancouver thing, but to Elliot Friedman's point, it does seem to be particularly toxic in Vancouver. And Brian Burke backed him up on that. He 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 certainly has not had a great experience with the media here in Vancouver during his time as general manager here, and he, and he has talked about that. I think that the 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 one thing that and maybe the people living in Calgary can respond respond to this in a different way. The one thing I I feel like here. It's it's the comp it's competition about trying to be someone to being the smartest journalist in the room. It's like 
it's like we're trying to be the boy genius. We're trying to be Jason Bruff or Mike Halford. We're trying to be this person that is already there, is already that type of personality, as opposed to being themselves asking a legitimate question. And as much as people find Ian McIntyre boring, I will... and. Rick Dollywall probably, like, in terms of... Like, Rick Dollywall has a personality. But I would argue that probably Ian McIntyre and Rick Dollywall probably get some of the best information because they are not necessarily jerks. They go when they ask. They're persistent about their questions. They ask their questions, but they ask their questions in a more intelligent way. And I feel like in Vancouver, it's a bit of... um, Like, we're trying to... I'm trying to be the smartest smartest guy or gal in this room. And I'm trying to out question you all. Please look at me. That's that's the vibe I get here in Calgary. I just don't feel like the media there w- wants to rock the boat. Like I feel like Eric Eric Francis is the most inside of inside of the Flames, and he doesn't rock the boat in terms of like criticizing the Flames in any way, shape, or form. Um, He's Milan Lucic's biggest cheerleader. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it's it just feels like a different it's not it's not a competitive journalistic market in the sense of like everybody kind of works together and they're not trying to attack necessarily or not trying to one up everybody where I feel like here in Vancouver it's a one up it's a game it's yeah. a game of trying to be the smartest person in the room um in regards to that Kev uh I think a lot of that has come from Jason Boschford and and uh and we do miss him because he was fantastic at that. But now everyone's trying to fill that void. And everyone is – no one's Jason Botchford. He did that in such an amazing way where he was able to be antagonistic but in a in a more respectful way. He was able to be – to 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 push the envelope but not um, really, really anger the – the, the the team and the and the coach and the GM to a point where they don't want to talk with him because you had that with was it well the Burke Burke had it with uh, Pratt and as well as I think um, Gallagher um, and and now we've got Green with uh, Jeff Patterson like it's no I get I I completely agree with you know who you are and and make that your voice don't try and be someone else there's a reason. Harmon Dial is is so well, well revered. He he has his own style and and writes an amazing like completely way too smart articles. Um, Thomas Drance, I really like him because I, I find he finds a really good balance of this is why they're bad, but this is what they're doing well. And my my issue with a lot of the a lot of the other ones is that they can skew too far to one way or the other, whether too positive or too negative. Where it's like you can't, you either you can't. They're they're way too critical to a point where like you, they just can't. Every every decision is it's automatically wrong. Versus other, and then there's other ones where it's like, okay, I, now I gotta. They they feel like they have to correct it, and then they end up having they end up being way too like positive where. Jim Benning can do no wrong. Like this is was the plan to begin with. Like no, there's a there's a balance that you need to find and a vo- your own voice that you need to find before. And then once you find that, then you're gonna find your li- your 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 people that are gonna gonna go to bat for you. What, what, in the Calgary, Devin Heidi in the Calgary media, do you feel like there's any antagonism towards the Flames organization in the sports? I think social media, that's a whole entire different thing and a topic for another time. But in terms of media, do you feel like there's an antagonistic relationship with anyone? I feel like that they all seem to like actually just get along and and kind of respect each other. And I honestly don't see there being a problem with that, to be honest. Like maybe like maybe like you're losing the product a little bit and, and maybe there needs to be a little bit more competition, but... Um, I don't really see it because Eric Francis, I think he used to be that guy, but now that Eric Francis is part of the Flames broadcast and part of Sportsnet, it's not, it's not quite the same. Uh, he's not as polarizing, I think, anymore, for sure. Well, I yeah, think part I, of that is the, uh, oh, go, go ahead, Dev. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, 
I, I would have to agree that he's he's toned it back since he's been a part of the broadcast. I mean, he still he still has his uh, far takes of uh, of certain things. Um, and uh, another person is uh, Ryan Pinder. He's on the afternoon show of uh, Sports at nine sixty with Steinberg and Pinder, uh, and he he has some some pretty hot takes as well uh opinionated but the things is that like it's it's it, at the end of the day it comes down to respect and it comes down to um uh, kevin you said you said it right you know and sean you did too just you know be yourself uh don't try and be somebody that you're not don't try and be this you know polarizing uh figure um i i mean the the last polarizing figure uh in our generation that's been can because of his opinion is uh, Don Cherry and you know people you know re- maybe not fully respected him for his opinions but they they tuned in to see you know what he was going to say uh and I feel like that's that that generation and that ideology of uh journalism and of um just uh media in general is kind of you know going by the wayside because of um where we are in society and where we are as a uh uh, as an nhl and um it's i don't know i i I, as far as calgary goes i don't think that uh i don't i don't think we have that here i I agree with heidi i think that uh, we we all have mutual respect for each other and um you know you do have your hot takes every once in a while but you know you you have respect for that person because of who they are because they're being true to themselves i i think just in general the smaller the media market the more everybody gets along uh right like you can definitely see how things are in in toronto montreal and vancouver compared to some of the smaller cities um I don't know. Perhaps back in the day, there was more rivalry between scribes in, in Calgary between newspapers. I, I'm not as uh, familiar with uh, you know who the big names are there now, um, but certainly in Vancouver, the dynamic of having two competing uh, broadcast outlets in covering sports, it, you know, certainly adds uh, to the gamesmanship that goes on there. You know, I mean, it's very clearly, you know, all the sports that people are support the brand, build the brand and everybody else is, you know, antagonistic. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating to watch in that sense. Um, I, I mean, the build the brand thing's important. I mean, I, I think Heidi's 100 percent right about Eric Francis. I mean, he, you know, the tone is is definitely more supportive. I mean, I think it was I think it's ridiculous when it comes to the whole arena discussion. I mean, you know, Eric just comes across as such a flames apologist for for getting an arena built, but um, it 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 definitely you know there's definitely that effect. I, the Oilers uh, they demoted um, well not they the, the sports that demoted demoted probably with some pressure from the Oilers uh, um, Drew Remenda from the primary color role in favor of Louis DeBrusque, who frankly is uh, less critical an analyst than Drew Remenda is. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Don't get me don't get me started on that rant. We're all, we'll be on here for another hour. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, but, but you know, so there is definitely that impact. I think. But you, you look a little bit with the Oilers here, and you know, you look at how the rights holder cover them. I I feel like I don't listen a lot, but they it seems to me that they cover with a little bit more of the sports night way here in Vancouver, where it's you know a little bit praiseworthy. Bob Stoffer is always positive on Twitter about the Oilers win or lose. Where you look at Ryan Rashog and you look at Jason Greger on TSN, they'll criticize the Oilers when they need to. So it is interesting. There is that little bit of that dynamic there I see at Edmonton, but it's not. I don't feel it's as antagonistic within the media there. Like I don't feel I mean, it's tox as toxic. One of the things we haven't touched on yet is the is the radio wars in Vancouver too. I think that adds to it. You've got Sportsnet, who's the who's the, who are the broadcast uh, rights holders, and then you've got TSN, who don't. So they they have a little more leeway to be more critical, and they've taken it and run with it. Like well, they, really, they they're really running with it now. But I, I would say when they were the rights holder in the final year, they they didn't seem to pull very many punches, and they ended up not being the rights holder anymore. But they certainly weren't afraid to go after Willie Desjardins and run him out of town. Oh yeah, they were hard on Desjardins. Oh man, brutal. They are very hard on him. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, and you know, 
I, I mean, I don't follow the Toronto media close enough to get the dynamic there. If there's a Sportsnet TSN particular war, I I don't notice it so much. Um, well, there there isn't, of course, because of the MLSE connection, right? I mean, MLSE owns most of the teams, and Bell and Rogers have equal ownership in MLSE, so there is that. Right, but there's still a bit of a ratings competition, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, Certainly a competition to get you know news stories and scoops, right? I mean, we saw that on trade deadline day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And in Montreal, it's it's the English French debate, and Ottawa, it's it's there's it's just a quieter market, and Winnipeg's probably quieter that way as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be an interesting thing. Uh, the last two quick topics here. Uh, the emergency goaltender debate is is taken since, of course, we had the David Ayer situation. He had his 15 minutes of fame. He did his talk shows. He got honored by the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, there was a little bit of the, yeah, this is great, but then there was a little bit of the undercurrent that said, we, we do have a problem here because we cannot have 42-year-old Zamboni drivers being emergency goaltenders. Uh, now... I think one of the things that was not brought up in all of this was if this was a playoff game, that this happened to the Toronto Maple Leafs, and it had to be an emergency goaltender situation, that would have been a disaster one way or the other. It would have been a, a like a disaster for the team having to put in an emergency goaltender uh, in a situation like this. Uh, so what would you... What do you think we should... What are your recommendations here? What do you think should be done about the emergency goaltender situation? I don't know because, well, a how is a forty-two-year-old Zamboni driver like your your emergency goaltender in Toronto? Like <laughs> the hockey mecca, and all you can get is a forty-two-year-old Zamboni driver. That that blew my mind. If it was in Carolina or some a, a smaller town in like or a smaller just like market in the states, that would make sense to me. But that's another tangent. So we're at like twelve tangents now. Twelve, yes. Um, but I don't know what you can do. Like I like, can you carry a third goalie? But then you run into, is he really part of the team? Uh, is he really like, is he part of the salary cap? Uh, does he do anything else? It's just, it's, it's weird, right? Um, can you throw in some sort of like, quote unquote, like levels or skills or bear, like that is, that's needed to, to match it. But then how do you get, how do you find a one in Florida that matches that? How do you find one in, in like, in Nashville, that matches that. Like it's just, I think there's too many variables that allow it to be anything that, that that really hinder it from being anything more than what it is now. Yeah, and the thing is, is like the 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 possibility of both dressed goalies going down in the same game is still really, really small. I mean, everybody seems to be forgetting that. It's like, oh, this, you know, this, we can't have this happen again. It, you know, it could come up again. Well, when's the next time it's realistically going to come up again? But what if it does, like, I guess to me, if it's a playoff game in this well, happens, I, know, I, I don't. Here's the thing, Kevin. Uh, is it the same situation for the playoffs or not? Because I believe teams can uh, carry around extra players in the playoffs, can they not? Yeah, they can. There's no there's no salary cap in the playoffs. You can play, you can bring up a third goalie or whatever, but they're not dressed. Yeah. That's the thing. You could have a third goalie in the press box, but under the rules, I believe, is that they can't go in. They I, mean, I think they would list. be able to solve this for the playoffs a lot more simply than, than in the regular season with so many games and so much travel and logistics involved. Yeah. Like, I, I get I get the, the idea of like trying to fix, quote-unquote fix it, but you've had, I think, two emergency goalies play in the last 20 years. Yeah, it's happened to be in the last three years or five years. Yeah, I, I know. And in, and in this case, it 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 didn't advantage the the team that was, um, you know, facing the facing the the amateur goalie. They, that team still lost. How do you feel about that, Devin? 
Well, and and in Chicago, Chicago still won, right? Um, and and to, to to your point earlier, Sean, like, um, you know, if you're gonna get a outsourced goalie to go to Florida or Nashville, fuck, sign me up. Sorry, swearing, swearing, I know. Um, sign me up because like, who would want to be in Nashville or in uh, Florida making uh, 50k a year? Uh, to, to be a, a emergency goalie for that team or that uh, that arena, um, I, I think another. I, I don't think this this is what should, they should do, but I've heard the uh, the idea floated around to be like, okay, well, how about your um, your goalie coach has to has to lace him up and uh, put on the pads to to jump in there. I think that's a that's a fun little twist. I don't obviously that I don't I don't think that would happen, but I thought that was a kind of a fun little thing that they uh uh the media's been talking about so because uh, a 42 year old know, zamboni driver wasn't old enough we're gonna get 50 year old goaltender coaches or it brings it brings in uh younger goaltender coaches eh uh, maybe maybe <laughs> yeah i mean just imagine i mean there's already been a lot of discussion about this right but imagine if it was toronto that needed to put the the emergency backup goalie in and they lost Oh dear Lord, we'd have changes all over. Oh my God! <laughs> like the the scene that would ensue over that. I mean, even for Carolina, I mean, if it, it, you know, there's a net. If they lost, uh, you can bet Rod Brindamore would be bristling about the whole situation. Yeah, I, I just to me, the, my concern isn't. It's not necessarily. It, it's it's a great story. I'm not saying that, but I do think in the playoffs. Uh, I don't know. I, I I I think they need to be. There needs to be some sort of preparation for for the next. You know, if if this situation happens, and you're right, it's likely not going to happen. But but you never you never know, right? So, I yeah, I don't. Well, I think, it, it it does seem like a simple solution though to to just change it so that. Uh, your, your black aces, which are your your kind of your your third string players and goaltender, are uh, ready at the helm. Once once the first goalie goes down, that uh, that goaltender goes down to start lacing him up and uh, get, gets uh, gets on the bench just in case. You know, uh, I I don't see why that would be such a big thing. But during the regular season, you know, it, it, I think that that's the that's the major question. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's the most practical solution for the playoffs. One suggestion I heard from somebody, and I wish I could remember who it was, but um, <laughs> what do you guys think of having a player put on the goalie gear and go in? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be interesting. I think we saw that in uh, the OHL this past year. Yeah. I think he got loaded up for like 10. I mean, just the, the, the reason why this was suggested is because in baseball, when they run out of pitchers or they, they just can't, you know, they, they may have a guy that's uh, active but uh, pitched the last few days and isn't available or whatever. When they get to a point of throwing in the position player, you know, that that stirs some debate all the time about how kind of absurd it is. And But it happens with regularity in baseball. Well, when they go to 15, 17 innings. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes they're out there with the friggin' game on the line, <laughs> you know, uh, by necessity. Other times it's just they've thrown up the surrender flag and just trying to complete the game. But um, we've seen, I've, I've seen situations in the CFL where the kicker gets hurt. Some, a lot of teams just have the one kicker. And so what do you get? You've got some wide receiver out there lining up for a field goal with the game on the line. There's yeah. no emergency kicker, right? And what happens if both backup quarter, if a backup quarterback gets injured, right? Yeah, I mean, there's some, you know, well, I mean, in football, they usually have, they have three every game that are on the roster or, or active, so it's very unlikely they go through three of them. But I mean, you could theoretically have a scenario where some receiver with some quarterbacking experience has to get in there and get it done and give it a try, <laughs> you know. Uh, the the could one you guys thing imagine, I would say that uh, uh, Tyler Myers <laughs> suiting up. <laughs> the, unfortunately, guys, I think there's one 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 issue with the having black aces is that the AHL playoffs are usually around the same time as the NHL playoffs. So if your AHL team is doing well, just like you are, 
then you don't you aren't going to have as many black aces. That's that's true. That's that's. But, oh, well, I mean, overall, what's more important, your AHL or NHL? Like you, you, you're still the same organization, and you know, I feel like, yeah, your your AHL, you want to. I mean, you want to win that Calder Cup, I guess, but you know, uh, the, the Stanley Cup is more important and uh, brings in more revenue. So uh, maybe they need to switch up uh, the AHL to NHL uh, uh, playoffs. Well, are you are you willing to 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 detriment your AHL team and, and piss off your your the, the guys down there just for the one percent chance that both your goalies get injured in the NHL game? Absolutely, hundred uh, percent. Banners fly forever in the NHL, and it's it, it's more about you know you, you can kind of I don't know how to grandfather it in, but um, yeah, I, it, it give it gives you more incentive to get more depth. It gives you more incentive as an organization to uh, you know play play your the, the players you want to develop and give them the the opportunity and the the circumstance of a playoff situation to be in the AHL and it gives the the, the potential of you know something happening that uh, you know your your A A prospects can get in a playoff game. I don't know. It, it's it's just process of elimination, I guess. It does, you know, it does put some pressure on on it organizational depth for goalies like if you want i mean you're talking five you know five goalies here right you need two for the nhl team two for the ahl team plus the emergency backup yeah and if i'm an emergency if i'm an aspiring nhl goaltender i i'm i'm playing in the ahl as, as opposed to not in the NHL or make it a little bit more money, having the opportunity to play as opposed to getting a hundred thousand dollars with the possibility. Like I don't, I'm not going to get practice time. Uh, I'm not going to get any of that. I don't know. I, it's, I think there's, I, I still think there needs to be some discussion on it, but yeah, I'm not like in the playoffs for sure. I think that just needs something. That's, that's my thing. Uh, the last thing is February 28th. 2010 tell us where you were tell us how you and how you felt Mm. you guys go ahead (laughs) well i actually visited uh, where i was 10 years ago on that day uh this past friday um i was at a local bar in town brewster's which is now split into a couple different uh, establishments but uh I decided to uh, go there after work and uh, <laughs> have a cu- have a couple pints and, and reminisce. I was running around that whole bar when uh, when Crosby scored, high fiving anyone who would throw up their hand. Hmm. Yes, yeah, I was in uh, Richmond. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had uh, me and uh, another friend of ours over at his place. Uh, so it was, uh, it was me, Jeff Wilson and, uh, Jeff's parents. And, uh, when Prize tied up the game, of course I was feeling ill. And then when it was in intermission, I had to get another beer going. It's the middle of the day still. <laughs> um, you know, just, just try and relax. I mean, I was just pacing around. And once the overtime started, I mean, it's, you know, you're watching hockey again and then just, just bang, you know, all of a sudden Crosby has the puck and then it was just pandemonium We're falling all over the furniture and it was just craziness. And then I was lucky enough to uh, head downtown afterwards and enjoy the uh, street fun. Heidi. Uh, Honestly, I'm a terrible person, and I actually can't remember exactly where I was. Uh, I was watching it. I have. I could have still been out. I know I was out visiting family in uh, just outside of Winnipeg, like most of that week of the the Olympics or the couple of weeks. Um, I think I was back back here in Calgary though, but I it. Just, I, it wasn't anywhere exciting. I know I wasn't at a bar or anything like that. I was probably just honestly sitting at, at home watching it. But uh, I do I do remember actually and watching it and getting very excited about it, though. Devin? Uh, yeah, I was at uh, the Black Swan off of uh, McLeod Trail in the south uh, 
southeast southwest of uh of calgary and uh don't tell my fiance but i was with an ex-girlfriend and um yeah it was uh it, it was really it was really a, a great atmosphere to be in um i just remember uh when us tied it up uh, it was uh the, the whole pub was just uh, like i i just I, what I'm trying to get at is the, the whole the whole atmosphere of everybody's ups and downs uh, or downs and ups um, in chrono- chronological order uh, was uh, was really cool to experience and um, I've never I've never been a part of something like that since and it'll be it'll be in my memory bank forever and um, God I, I, I you can only hope that uh, the Winter Olympics come back to ca- Canada and. Um, I know it was close to coming to Calgary, but uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be that much special, that much more special to be on uh, uh, you know home soil to to win it again. But um, and yes, I'm I'm calling for a, a Canadian win next time it's uh, in in Canada. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was really cool to to experience there, and um, yeah, I uh, I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, I was just with uh, with some friends. Uh, it wasn't anything super spectacular, but it was a pretty heart wrenching thing. And yeah, it was just it was, what a crazy game! I still it's one of my one of the greatest games I I can ever remember. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, huh? Oh, yeah, it was it was good times. I'm glad we won. Um, and that was a great interview. That El- speaking of media, uh, what El- the Elliot Friedman's. If you haven't watched that, that Elliot Friedman, Sidney Crosby interview is a must watch. Go back and find that because that was a, a great interview uh, reflecting back on the golden goal uh, and the impact that he had and what happened in the dressing room. I, I just I think Elliot Friedman is becoming one of the best is is becoming the insider in in the NHL right now, like the premier insider. I, I, that's my personal opinion. Um Heidi, I have a, I, I have a question. Who? What happened more? Did the Edmonton Oilers score more goals, eight, than we had tangents tonight? <sighs> That's so hard to say because I kind of like stopped paying attention. Um, <laughs> not gonna lie, um, but uh, it's probably roughly the same amount. It's just yeah, some of your tangents you went on just lasted for a long time. Oh, I suppose <laughs> that's why they're called tangents. <laughs> that's why they're called. It's like the Oilers just were popping goals left, right, and center, and that's right. Yeah, it was just kind of uh, it was kind of intense. Yeah, sorry, I got distracted sometimes when we put the TV on while while podcasting. Yeah, that's it's squirrel. Uh, sorry, the next podcast. I just I'm going to tease this. I want us to prepare to have a debate. Who deserves the Hart Trophy? Austin Matthews or Leon Dreisaitl? We'll have Quinn a, Hughes. A, or what? what? <laughs> we'll have a, a, because I, you know, that. Well, maybe him too. I don't know. We'll get into that. But I think uh, I, there's an interesting debate coming forward here. But uh, how do we follow everyone? I am Beardy Canuck zero three on Twitter, and I will con- constantly remind people. That bad games happen, bad third periods happen, as we saw tonight with Nashville giving up five goals in a third period when you're tied. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can follow me at Beardy Connect zero three, and I'm on Twitter at T Noble T N O B L E. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter and social media at Hide Amazeballs. And I learned today that uh, Canucks fans and media are very dramatic. <laughs> Just a bit. Um, yeah, you can you can find me at uh, Gord How zero nine on Twitter, and uh, you can find that. Uh, follow me for God's sake! I only have ten followers. Um, yeah, you, you can uh, you can subscribe to uh, some some leaf stuff. I know that that it that it is everywhere, but there's also flame stuff and uh, anti Canuck stuff on there. So uh, yeah, follow. All right. Any? Did you learn anything? I learned that uh, Austin Matthews, uh, you know, can be a beast um, when he wants to be. It's just whether or not he wants to or not. Okay. Tyler, did you learn anything? Uh, I I learned uh, that um, you had this uh, thing for for uh, who was it? Suter again? Gary Suter. Gary Suter. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, there you go. Yes. I also, I also learned Sean has strong feelings about him being dirty as well. Yes, I, I learned that as well. That's learning. <laughs> and you can follow me at KVOLE, and I always will just remind you. It's coming. This, this is, it's coming. The Toronto Maple Leafs, Leafs literally, literally, and that word, word is overused this smidge, but, but literally gave, gave up 50 shots at home to a team, team that played last night, and that, that would be embarrassing enough on its, its own. own. On its own! That, that would be unacceptable. On its own! You would never believe that that team would A, make the playoffs, and B, do anything in the Oh, we're just getting started. That's, That's not, not even the worst part. part. Are you kidding me? That will never, ever get old. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.